if I understand what you wanted to say. Is, but <laughs> if you write, if I ask you goat, and if you write cow, that's not it look the same. <laughs> one or two characters. Remember, during my lecture, I have mentioned few things, like this is important. For example, just one example, when we went over the neuroglial cells, I told you that just remember, you know, uh, you'll get a couple of questions from that. One important property of neuroglial cell and one or two functions. So not too much information. Just you have taken notes, so you should be fine. Today, we'll talk about the spinal cord. You know that the central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. We have talked about the brain already, so today we'll talk about the spinal cord. Another important part of the central nervous system. First, we'll see the anatomy of the spinal cord. That means the structure of the spinal cord. Then we'll see the external features. If you see the spinal cord from outside, how it looks like, we'll see that. What are the structures you'll be able to see from outside. Then we'll talk about the functions of the spinal cord. Then we'll talk about the spinal nerves. As you know already, that from both sides of the spinal cord, 31 pairs of spinal nerves arise or come out. So those are the spinal nerves arise from the side of the spinal cord. And there are 31 pairs in number. We'll see how the spinal nerves are formed. Then we'll talk about the tracts inside the spinal cord. If you cut the spinal cord and see inside, you'll see a number of tracts. Tracts are what? Tracts are bundle of, bundles of fibers. I have shown you in last lecture that if you see many fibers are bundled heavily together, that is a tract. So if you cut the spinal cord, Inside the spinal cord, you will see two types of tracks. Some tracks are going upwards, that means towards your brain, and some are going downwards. So ascending tracks going upwards and descending tracks are going downwards. So we'll see what are the important ascending and descending tracks present inside the spinal cord. Then we'll talk about the sensory and motor relay. Relay is what? You know, relay race. You have seen relay race in Olympic, right? What is that? One person, one runner, hands the stick to the next person, then he starts to run. So, when the electrical signal goes to the nerve at different locations, one neuron gives signal to the next. So those are the relay stations at different locations. One group of neurons will give the signal to the next group of neurons. Then they will take the signal up and then will give to another group of neurons. Okay? So that's the relay. Relay of signal, electrical signal. So we'll see along the sensory and motor pathway, pathways where the relays take place. Then we'll talk about spinal cord trauma, trauma to the spinal cord or injury to the spinal cord. It is very common. We commonly hear that. Uh, okay. Uh, here we know that in, in the United States a lot of motor accident, car accidents occur and spinal cord trauma is very uh, you know common here. Okay, so first 
the anatomy of the spinal cord. Location. Spinal cord starts at the foramen magna. So the upper end is at the foramen magna here. It starts here. And then goes down all the way to lumbar one vertebrae. So this is lumbar five, four, three, two, one. Here. So basically the spinal cord starts here at the foramen magna and ends at L1, lumbar one vertebrae. So in this part you don't have spinal cord. Remember that. That's the extent. Then the length of the spinal cord is about 18 inches. That means 45 centimeter long. And the width is half inch, or 14 millimeter. I may ask this question that where the spinal cord ends or it starts and what's the length of the spinal cord? Functions. You remember just a few seconds ago, I have said that inside the spinal cord, two types of traps are present. Some are going upwards and some traps are going downwards. So the spinal cord provides two-way communication, to and from the brain. Those traps are going upwards, that means they are going to the brain, taking the signal to the brain. Those are going downwards, they are taking the signal out from the brain. So spinal cord is carrying signal towards the brain and away from the brain. So that's why we say both way communication. Some tracks of fibers are taking signal upwards towards the brain, some are taking downwards. Carries commands from the brain to the peripheral nerves. When we decide that, for example, I move my hand, then your brain will send signal down to the spinal cord. Then what will happen? From the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, because the spinal cord cannot go here, right? Spinal cord is just inside the vertebral column. So from the spinal cord, the spinal nerves, you know, arrive, they take the signal to the uh, structure of the body. So those are the peripheral nerves. Protection of the spinal cord. Like your brain, spinal cord is also a very important and delicate organ. It should be heavily protected, and it is. What are the structures that protect the spinal cord? Bones. Which bones? Vertebrae. You know that spinal cord is located inside the vertebral column. So vertebrae protect the spinal cord. Meninges. Around the spinal cord, you have three meninges, like your brain. Dura mater, dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. You have seen those three meninges in the brain too. So, three meninges cover the spinal cord. Then, in subarachnoid space, like your brain, you have cerebrospinal fluid. So that fluid also protects the spinal cord. One thing is different than the brain, that's the epidural fats. No fat is present in the skull around the brain to protect the brain, but around the spinal cord you have fats. So this is different than the brain. And so uh, those are the protections. Just remember that one thing is different, that's the facts. So here you see the structures protecting the spinal cord. So this is a cross section. If you cut the vertebral column like this and see, this is the spinal cord. Okay, this is the spinal cord. Now we see from outside, 
the inside, which structures are protecting the spinal cord. First, the vertebrae, the bone. Okay. Then you see, this is the fat. Epidural fat. Epi means outside. So, this is the dura mater. Dura mater, and outside of the dura mater, you have epidural fat. Then dura mater. Arachnoid matter and fear matter is this one attached to the spinal cord. Always remember, fear matter will stay attached to the brain or the spinal cord. So here you see the layer, thin layer that is attached to the spinal cord directly. That's the fear matter. This one. Okay. And you have cerebrospinal fluid in subarachnoid space. Here, this is the arachnoid matter, something is below. So here, in this space, you have the cerebrospinal fluid. So those are the structures protect the spinal cord. Okay, now, <clears throat> if you see the spinal cord from outside, Structures you will be able to see. You will see denticulate ligaments. Denticulate ligaments are extensions of pia matter. So those are ligaments, thin ligaments, many thin ligaments, they extend from the pia matter. So if this is the spinal cord, this is your spinal cord and you know that pia matter is attached to the surface of the spinal cord so this is the pia matter and now what happens from pia matter a number of ligaments arise and those ligaments get attached to the dura matter so this is the dura matter this is the dura and this is the pia so from PA, denticulate ligaments arise and get attached to the dura matter. Okay. So what function the denticulate ligaments have? The main function is if this is the spinal cord, you see they are attaching the spinal cord to the dura matter. That means they prevent the movement of the spinal cord. It's like, you know, if I tie your hands and legs to the wall, you won't be able to move. So, same thing is being done by the denticulate ligaments. They are tying the spinal cord to the dura mater, so it won't be able to move much. Okay, so that's the main purpose. Conus medullaris. The lower end of the spinal cord is conical. Conical shape, cone shaped. That cone shaped part, lower end of the spinal cord, is called the conus medullaris. Simple. Okay? So, cone shaped, lower end of the spinal cord is called the conus medullaris. Corde equine means horse tail. Have you seen horse tail? You have seen right. So quad equina means horse tail, tail of the horse. So if you see the lower end of the spinal cord, you see many nerve roots come out from the lower end of the spinal cord like this, and this part looks like a tail of a horse. That part is called the quad equina. So it's actually a bunch of nerve roots at the lower end of the spinal cord. Okay, uh, then phylum terminal. From the lower pointed end of the spinal cord, this is the pointed end of the spinal cord, terminal end of the spinal cord, a ligament, a, a ligament or you can say cord-like structure that arise 
and gets attached to the coccyx, the tailbone. tailbone. Okay. So this cord that arises from the lower end of the spinal cord and ties the lower end of the spinal cord to the coccyx bone, tailbone, this is called phylum terminally. Okay. So I'm repeating again, phylum terminally is a cord that arises from the lower end of the lower pointed end of the spinal cord and it ties the lower end to the coccyx or tailbone. That is also important because if the lower end is free, lower end of the spinal cord is free, then what will happen? It will move like this. Since it is tied to the coccyx, the lower end, the spinal cord will stay straight, will stay straight and will not move like this. Okay? So those are the structures you will be able to see uh, if you see the spinal cord from outside. Okay, uh, from this slide, just remember that at two locations, the spinal cord gets wider at two locations, expanded. Those are called cervical enlargement and lumbar enlargement. So, at two locations, the spinal cord gets expanded or wider. One is in the cervical part, that is called cervical enlargement, and another is in the lumbar part, that is the lumbar enlargement. Why in those two locations the spinal cord is wider? The reason is, you know that many nerves are present in our upper and lower limbs. Many nerves are large, big nerves are going to the spinal cord from upper limbs. So, in which area? In the cervical area. The cervical part of the spinal cord is receiving those nerve inputs. That's why that area is wide. And the lumbar part of the spinal cord is receiving the input from the lower limb nerves, your leg nerves. That's why that area is also expanded. Just uh, you know those two information. One is where the enlargements are present, and number two, why those enlargements are because input from the upper and lower limb nerves. Okay, another interesting thing is lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture. What is that? Lumbar puncture is the way to collect the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF from the body. So, why we need to collect the cerebrospinal fluid? We need to collect the cerebrospinal fluid to do the chemical analysis, to do the culture of cerebrospinal fluid to see if any blood or microorganism is present there. If any blood or microorganism is present in the cerebrospinal fluid. We test that. We try to see if those are present. If someone gets injury to the brain or the spinal cord, if we suspect that that person might have injury, internal injury in the brain or the spinal cord, what we'll do? We'll, of course, we'll do the x-ray or other things. We'll collect the cerebrospinal fluid and we'll try to see if there is any blood present in the cerebrospinal fluid because cerebrospinal fluid flows around the brain and the spinal cord. So if anywhere bleeding occurs, you will find the blood cells there. Red blood cells or white blood cells you will find there, okay? So that is one reason we collect the cerebrospinal fluid. Number two, meningitis, you know, infection, inflammation of the meninges. So if that you suspect that someone has meningitis or might have meningitis, you collect the cerebrospinal fluid and do the culture 
to see if any microorganism is present there. So that's easy. If you see the microorganism, then you will use the antibiotic, that particular antibiotic. Okay? So that's the reason why we collect the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, how to collect the cerebrospinal fluid? We collect the cerebrospinal fluid from the lower lumbar region, lower lumbar part. Why is that? Larger spaces? Yes, because where the spinal cord ends, L1, right? right? Lumbar 1. You know that, lumbar 1. So, if this is lumbar 1, then you know that below that, you don't have the spinal cord. But what happens, the coverings, the meninges, they continue, go all the way down. But the spinal cord ends, but the covering continues. So, you have a lot of fluid here, but no spinal cord in this part, right? You can easily insert the needle there, without the chance of damaging the spinal cord. Make sense? So, that's why we collect the cerebrospinal fluid, we insert the needle in the lower lumbar part because no spinal cord is there. <clears throat> now, how we do that? We ask the patient to lie sideways, lie down sideways, and bend the body forward like this, okay? Move the body, upper part forward like this. When you do that, what happens is, see, in the back of your spine, in between the spinous processes, you have been, you have space, these spaces. Now, if you bend the body like this, then the spine, spinous process will go like this, so this space will open more if you bend like this. So these spaces will open more. So it will be easy for you to just insert the needle through the space, okay? So just make it bigger, make the space opening bigger, make sense? Okay. Now, from where you will collect the cerebrospinal fluid? Subdural, because we know that cerebrospinal fluid is present in, sorry, not subdural, subarachnoid space, right? So, we know that cerebrospinal fluid is located in the subarachnoid space. So, you will insert the needle all the way to subarachnoid space, and then we draw the fluid out from here, okay? And do the cut here. So that's the lumbar puncture. Okay, now what I'll do, I'll draw a beautiful picture, okay? For you, and you will copy it. A nice picture I'll draw on the board. You know, my pictures are always nice, so you like it. Uh, how the spinal cord is formed, uh, sorry, how the spinal nerve is formed. I'll show that, okay? Very important, like your neuromuscular junction. This picture is also important. So, first, Draw the spinal cord. Okay. You know that in the spinal cord, this is a cross section. <coughs> Outer part is white matter. You already know that. White matter and inner part is gray matter, okay? Now, uh, sorry, two, three, white matter and gray matter. Now, if you see the gray matter, in each half of the gray matter, you have three horns, you know, horn-like structure. Those are called horns. This is front, this is front, this is back. So this is called ventral horn. This is called dorsal 
harm. Some places you'll see anterior horn, posterior horn, that's fine. And this horn is called the lateral horn, this one. Lateral horn. So in each half of gray matter, you have three horns. Ventral horn, dorsal horn, and lateral horn. Now, in the ventral horn, now uh, you tell me, you know that. Where the cell bodies are clustered, you will find many cell bodies in the gray matter or white matter? Gray matter. I have shown that in last class, right? In the gray matter, you will see the cell bodies. Where you will find the myelinated fibers? White. Right. Because myelin sheet is white. So in the gray matter, we have many cells. In the ventral horn, the cells are called motor neurons. Okay? In the ventral horn, the neurons are motor, motor neurons. In the lateral horn, these neurons are autonomic neurons. Okay? So in the lateral horn, the clustered neurons are autonomic neurons. And then in the dorsal horn, the neurons are called sensory neurons. These are sensory neurons. Okay? So, you got three groups of neurons. One group in the ventral horn, another group in the lateral horn, and the other group in the dorsal horn. And three groups of neurons are different from each other. Motor neurons, sensory neurons, and autonomic neurons. Okay, now... From modern neurons, the axons arise and get out from the spinal cord, okay? And they bundle together and form ventral root. So, from the ventral or modern neurons, the axons or fibers arise and bundle together and form ventral root. And those fibers are connected to the dorsal horn neurons, that means sensory neurons, they also bundle together and form what? Dorsal root. So this is dorsal root. Okay? <clears throat> In the dorsal root, another group of neurons are here. In a round structure, this structure is called dorsal root ganglion. Ganglion is a round structure. If you see a round structure in a nerve, that is called usually a ganglion. And ganglion contains the neurons. Okay? So this ganglion is only present in the dorsal root, not present in the ventral root. 
and it is called very simple dorsal root ganglia, that round structure present in the dorsal root. That's the dorsal root ganglia. So when you see the spinal cord, uh, if you see dorsal root, that means the dors uh, dorsal root ganglia, that means it is the dorsal root. You can easily separate ventral root and dorsal root by looking the ganglia. Ganglia must be in the dorsal root. Okay. Now what happens see? These fibers of dorsal root and the fat it will take long long space. Okay, I, I will keep going this way. So you will need more space. So dorsal root and ventral root, they will meet, they will join together. Okay? So I'm showing that they join together here. They have joined together. And this is the spinal nerve. Okay, so this is the spinal nerve. So a spinal nerve is formed by the union of ventral and dorsal root together. They join together and form the spinal nerve. So if I ask you the question that in the spinal nerve, what kind of fibers you will find? Motor, sensory, or both? In the spinal nerve. You will find both type of fibers or only one type? Because I have said that two roots will meet, join together and form the <coughs> spinal nerve. That's why the spinal nerve is called a mixed type nerve. Makes sense, right? It is a mixed type nerve. It has both motor and sensory, both types of fibers. So it carries both motor signal and sensory signal because it has both types of fibers. If I ask you, ventral root is a mixed type root or it only carries one type of fiber? Only one. Which? Motor or sensory? Motor. How about dorsal root? It carries only sensory. Okay, so I may ask these questions. Whatever I have mentioned, I will ask. It. Now, next. What happens? Again, spinal spinal nerve is very short, very short nerve. Immediately after the spinal nerve is formed, then again it divides. Okay? Like this. But one interesting thing happens here. It divides, and in each division, both types of fibers enter. Because they have joined here in the spinal nerve, and now when the spinal nerve divides, both types of fibers enter into both divisions. Now, these divisions are called. Ramai. This is ventral ramus. This is dorsal ramus. Ramus is singular. If you indicate one, that is ramus. If you indicate both, ramai. R A M I. Okay. Um, so Spinal cord, spinal nerve will divide and will form two rami. And in both rami, 
you will find <coughs> both sensory and motor fibers. Okay. And then the ramai will enter into the body. This is your body wall. This is your body wall. And this is the back of the body. This is the front of the body. Okay. So, both ventral and dorsal rami will enter into the body. Ventral rami will supply the front part of the body. Dorsal rami will supply the back part of the body. Okay. Now, you tell me if spinal nerve was not formed, if the rami were not formed, if your body is here, just think that your body is here, getting signal directly from the roots, then back part of your body will get only what type of fibers? Yes, That's it. And the front part of the body only will get motor. That means what? You will be able to move your front part of the body, no sensations, no feeling, no touch pain temperature, and your back part of the body will feel all the things, but you won't be able to move. <coughs> so that's not good. So that's why you need the formation of this spinal nerve where both types of fibers will mix, and then when the rami will be formed, each rami, each ramus will get both types of fibers. That's will make sure, that will make sure that your body, everywhere of your body is getting both sensory and motor, okay? So, uh, remember this picture, this is important, I may ask you a number of questions from here, for example, how many horns are present in the gray matter, right? In each half you have three, which horn contains what type of neurons? Then, what is ventral ramus, what is dorsal ramus, what is ventral root, what is dorsal root, okay? Ganglion is present in which root, which root carries what type of fibers, which ramus carry, uh, carries what type of fibers. So, there, there could be a number of questions from here, but it is very important, okay? Yeah. You said the ramus carry both types. Yes, yes, both, both ramus ram carry both. Okay, now you know that the outer part of the spinal cord is the white matter. The outer part is the white matter. And white matter contains the fibers, myelinated fibers. That's why white matter looks white. Now, in some locations, those fibers heavily bundle bundle together and form the tracks. You know that if the fibers bundle together, that is the track. So in the white matter, you have a number of tracks. Two types of tracks are seen in the white matter. Ascending tracks and descending. Ascending tracks take the signal towards the brain because ascending, going up. Descending take the signal down from the brain, out from the brain. Okay, now we'll see, you see here, uh, all tracks are located in the white matter. This is the white matter, outer part, and all these are tracks. Some tracks have been colored with red, some tracks have been colored with blue, because we know that some tracks are ascending tracks, some tracks are descending tracks. So they have colored the ascending tracks with blue and descending tracks with red. Now, you tell me that if I touch your body, your skin, that signal will go to the brain, right? You know that the signal will, sensory signal will go to the brain. So, which track will take the signal to the brain? Ascending or descending? Ascending. ascending. Very good. So, ascending tracks are sensory tracks. Simple example, because if you touch your body, that signal will go to the brain. That means ascending tracks 
will carry the signal and that is sensory signal. So ascending tracks are sensory tracks because they carry sensory signals. Make sense? Then your brain does what? You already know. First it will integrate, process that signal. Very good. It will integrate or process the signal. Analyze the signal. And then we will send the signal down. And descending tracks will take the signal down from the brain, out from the brain. And what type of signal is that? For example, if, if something hot touches your skin, first the temperature signal will go to the brain. That's the sensory, you know that, right? Then you will move your hand out. The signal will come out from the brain to the muscle. So that's the motor. So motor will come out from the brain. And descending tracks will carry motor signal. Because motor will cause the movement. Make sense? If you, if you are hungry, you smell the food. Then the smell is sensory or motor? Sensory. Very good. So the smell will go up to the SND. Then, what will happen when you smell, if you are hungry? Salivary secretion will occur, right? That secretion is motor signal. Glands get motor signal, muscles get motor signal. Just remember that those two organs of our body get a lot of motor signal. Muscle for movement, gland for secretion. Those are motor signals. At the same time, what will happen in your stomach if you are hungry, if you smell the food? Contraction. As well as secretion, both will occur. So you see here that secretion and contraction, those are controlled by the model fibers. Anyway, so just I gave the example. So you will understand that the signal is getting down, that's the model. It will cause the movement and secretion. Okay, now I'll just name few important sensory and motor tracks. First, we number two. First, we'll see the important sensory tracks. Yes. Is this in our book? Or in our, like, is the picture of this in our, this guide? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is there, uh, that's the lab book, right? Yeah. I don't know if lab book has because we are, we are talking about this is lecture. So lab book, I, I don't know. Okay, so the ascending or sensory tracks, important ascending tracks are first spinothalamic. You underline that spinothalamic tracks. If you just see the name, Spinothalamus. That means it is starting where? Yes, spinal, spinal cord and going to the thalamus. thalamus. So if you think that, is it ascending or descending? Yes. Ascending because thalamus is in your brain, right? It's starting in the spine, spinal cord and going to the thalamus. So it <coughs> must be sensory. So in the case, if I ask you, tell me spinothalamic is a sensory or motor from its name. You can tell that it is sensory because it is ending in the thalamus of the brain. Make sense? Another is spinocerebellar. Again, starting in the spinal cord and ending in the cerebellum. Cerebellum is in the brain, you know that. So it is an ascending tract. That means it is a sensory tract. <coughs> Two other tracts are fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. Those two, uh, you won't be able to tell by looking the names. You have to remember, okay? So four important ascending or sensory tracts I have mentioned, spinothalamic, spinocerebellar, uh, then uh, the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. Two of them you can easily tell by their name. Their ending, that means going to the thalamus and the cerebellum. So if you see that is starting with spinal, that must be sensory. 
Now, uh, if you see the tracks, the end part of the name is spinal. That means it is ending in the spinal cord. That means it is descending. So that's the easy way to remember. If it starts with spinal, that is sensory or ascending. If it ends with spinal, that is model because ending, arriving in the brain and ending in the spinal cord. Uh, there are exceptions that, uh, that I have mentioned, fascicular gracilis, fascicular scimitis, you have to remember, okay? Okay, so I'll just name a couple of motor tracks, <coughs> descending tracks. The most important one is corticospinal. So see, it is ending with spinal, so it is motor or descending, starting in the cortex, motor cortex of the brain, and ending in the spinal cord. Rubrospinal, reticulospinal. So remember those three are important motor tracks or descending tracks. All are ending with the spinal. Okay. Corticospinal. That's the most important one, most powerful one that controls the movement of the body. Yes. So, uh, for the do you want us to be able to identify like the spot on that particular vertebra there, or do you just want us to know if it's ascending or descending? Okay. Uh, now, in three locations, relay, <laughs> sensory relay takes place in three locations, okay? Uh, when the sensory signal, for example, when I touch your skin, on the skin, the sensory signal goes to the brain. And in three locations, the signal is relayed. That means given to another group of neurons. So one group of neuron will give the signal to the next group of neuron. They will then take the signal up, then will give to another group of neuron, and finally the signal will reach to the brain. So in ascending or sensory pathway, three sets of neurons will carry the signal. First order neurons, second order neurons, and third order neurons. So first order neurons are located where? First order neurons are here. Because you know that this is the sensory. Dorsal root is sensory. So this group of neurons is the first order neurons. Then another group of neurons is located in the dorsal horn. This is the second group of neurons. And then from here, what will happen? Since this is the spinal cord, the signal will go up through the fibers and will go to the thalamus in the brain. So these fibers are very long. Long fibers will go all the way to the brain and will meet with that another group of neurons, sensory neurons, located in the thalamus. And these are the third order sensory neurons. Okay? So you see uh, three groups of neurons are present in the ascending or sensory pathway. Now, you tell me this is motor or sensory? sensory? Sensory, very good. So sensory will carry the signal towards the spinal cord from the body or towards the body from the spinal cord? Towards the, body from the, spinal. Towards the spinal cord, make sense? Because if you touch here, that signal will go to the spinal cord. That means towards the spinal cord, right? So sensory signal will always move this way. And when the motor command will come out from the brain and the spinal cord and will go to the muscle, right? From the spinal cord to the muscle. So that is 
in opposite direction from the spinal cord to the muscle of the body because motor will cause the movement. Okay, so here the direction of signal is opposite. The sensory will go towards the central nervous system. Motor will go away from the central nervous system. Okay. Just know those three locations if I ask you. Uh, first group of neurons in the dorsal root, second group of neurons in the dorsal horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord. And third group of neurons are located in the thalamus. And thalamus is called the major sensory relay station. If you hear my lecture, the uh, lecture I gave you before, uh, presented before, I said that thalamus is called the major sensory relay station because almost all sensory signals will be relayed here in the thalamus. Okay, now uh, descending or motor pathway. In motor pathway, there are two groups of neurons, not three. How many? Two. two groups of neurons. One group is located in the primary motor cortex. pathway or descending pathway, only two sets of neurons are present. One set is in the brain, which part of the brain? In the motor cortex of the brain and the lower set is located in the ventral horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord that we have already seen before. Okay, So from here, the motor command will go to the muscles. This the body. Okay. So the signal will go this way. Okay. Yes. So where are they again? The they're in the motor cortex. Yes. The, these are the upper motor neurons. Okay. And these are lower. lower. Upper means upper. Lower means lower. One set is in the spinal cord. That's the lower motor. One set is in the brain, that's the, which part of the brain? Motor cortex of the brain, that's the upper motor neuron, right? So, uh, less complicated, only two sets. In case of sensory, three sets. Okay. Uh, now, uh, just know that there are different motor tracts or descending tracts. And I said that, which one is the most powerful one? Cortical. Yes, the cortical spinal. I mentioned that cortical spinal is the most powerful one because it controls the movement, most of the movement. 
Now, corticospinal has another name that is called pyramidal tract. So, pyramidal tract is nothing but another name of corticospinal tract. Pyramidal tract. Pyramidal tract. Okay. Start corticospinal tract. Corticospinal tract. You will see there when I, I talked about the tracts, I said that uh, which motor tract is the most powerful corticospinal one. Okay, and corticospinal has another name. What is that? Pyramidal tract. Okay. No, no, that's the cavity. Okay, so now another information here. This is very interesting. Uh, the lower motor neurons, those are located in the ventral horn, they always do what? They always just listen carefully. The lower motor neurons always try to keep the muscles heavily constricted. Always try to contract the muscle forcefully. That's the function of lower motor neuron. Okay? They try to contract the muscles forcefully. And upper motor neurons, these neurons are telling the lower motor neurons, sending signal to the lower motor neurons and telling them don't contract forcefully. Got it? So, now you tell me, if I destroy the upper motor neurons, then what will happen in muscles? Will contract forcefully, very strongly, right? Because other mo upper motor neurons are telling the lower motor neurons always, don't contract forcefully, like inhibiting them. Now, since the upper motor neuron control is gone, then lower motor neurons are now free, right? They are free. They are not getting any inhibition, so they will contact more forcefully. It's like that, you know, uh, you have a small child, and your child always tries to run here and there, always wants to go away from you. And mother does what you do, you hold the child. Don't run, you know car is there or you may get hurt. So you are trying to stop. So lower motor neurons always try to work more. And what kind of work? Contract the muscle. Okay? Now when the upper motor neurons are dead, then no control on lower motor neurons. So they will get freedom. So they will contract the muscles for more forcefully. And that is called splastic paralysis. Last day. <coughs> will occur due to the destruction of upper motor neurons. The muscles will become splastic, become rigid, will become strong, strongly contracted. Okay? So <coughs> that is splastic. Now you tell me. If these neurons are fine, upper motor neurons are fine, if the lower motor neurons are destroyed, then what will happen to the muscles? Muscle will lose the contraction, right? So, so that is called the classic paralysis. 
lesson. In which the muscle will lose the tone, muscle will become very soft and weak. That is the classic type of paralysis. Okay. So now you understood why you see flaccid and is plastic, those two types of paralysis. One will occur due to the upper motor neuron distraction, another will occur due to the lower motor neuron distraction. Okay. <clears throat> and in a spinal cord injury, the classic type of paralysis will occur because lower motor neurons are located in the spinal cord, not in the brain. Trauma to the spinal cord. Spinal cord injury is very common, as I have mentioned at the very beginning today, and mostly occurs due to motor accident, car accident. And uh, the part of the body will be affected depending on the area where the spinal cord injury or location where the spinal cord injury has occurred. If the spinal cord injury occurs in the neck area, cervical area here, then the body below that part will be paralyzed. If injury occurs here in the spinal cord, then your whole lower body will be paralyzed. In this case, how many limbs will be affected? All four, All four right? So that's called quadriplasia. Quadri means four. Okay? All four limbs will be paralyzed. Now, if the injury occurs between thoracic one to lumbar one, because we know that the spinal cord ends at lumbar one. So if it starts in T1 and ends in lumbar one, then if, for example, injury occurs here, then the part of the body below there will be affected. The part above will remain okay, right? Will not be affected. So if you cut here, then this part will be affected below there. And in that case, only the lower two limbs will be affected. And that is called the paraplasia. The paraplasia, in paraplasia, the lower part, including two lower limbs, will be paralyzed, not all four. Upper two limbs remain okay, functional. Now, if injury occurs in one half, one side of the spinal cord, for example, in this side, but this side is okay, because we know that same neurons are in the other side, right? So, this, this side of the body will get the signal, will be fine, and one side of the body will be paralyzed, and that is called hemiplasia, okay? So, if you see the paralysis in one side of the body, that is the hemiplasia, okay? So, those are three conditions. You know, the guy uh, used to know as Superman, Christopher Lee, right? He got quadriplasia because his head twisted like this, and injury occurs here in the upper cervical part. Yes. So, is it possible to not be able to move your upper but your lower limbs, or? Uh, uh, it, it, it depends if the injury is partial injury in the spinal cord. Okay, the some fibers are going to the lower part, but those fibers are going to the upper part, those new ones are destroyed from the which can happen here. Yeah. Uh, does it, okay, so if it was quadriplegia, does that also affect, like, because obviously your heart's still beating, but does it, like, affect your intestines or anything, or is it only... Yeah, good question. Uh, remember, the heart and internal body organs are controlled by autonomic nervous system. Oh, yeah. So autonomic 
a different pathway. Yeah? So that's why they still function. Okay, so we have talked about triplets in last class. If you present the stimulus again and again, same stimulus, then your body will respond same way again and again. That is the reflex. Okay? So for example, if I put bright flashlight on your eye, your people will constrict. If I do it again, again your people will constrict. That is the reflex. Okay? If I hit here with hammer, if I can hit correctly, then your leg will shoot forward. If I do again, it will shoot forward. Sometimes it will not happen if you don't hit in correct location. Okay? That's the difference. So reflex is the response that occurs automatically. You have no control. Autonomic response due to the stimulus. And that response will be repeated again and again if you present the stimuli again and again. And to complete the reflex, you know that five components that I have mentioned before, receptors, then the sensory neurons, integration center, then the motor neurons, and the effector. Effector is the, usually, effectors are muscles or glands. For example, same example I'm giving, when you, you are hungry, you see the food, your retina of your eye has the receptors. So your eye has the receptors that will first capture the picture, and then will send to the brain through the sensory neurons. And brain will, brain is the integration center, will interpret that. And will send signal where? To your salivary glands. And will cause the secretion. In this case, the effector is the salivary gland, not the muscle. Okay? If I touch something hot, then the temperature receptors in your skin will receive that. So receptors are the first component. Then through the sensory neurons, the signal will go to the spinal cord, integration center. Then the spinal cord will send the signal to the muscles, through the motor neurons. In this case, muscles are the effectors. So effectors could be muscles or glands. Those are those two are the main effectors in our body. Will cause secretion or the movement. Uh, this is the reflex test that is called Davinsky's sign or Davinsky's test, reflex test. What is that? If you scratch, if you scratch the sole of the foot, how we do that? We usually ask the person to sit or lie and hold the foot like this and take something blank, don't take anything sharp, then you will cut the person's foot and you will kick it. Okay. <laughs> so you will take something, you can use your pen, you know, the other end of the pen, the blank end, or take something like this and hold the foot like this and scratch on the sole of the foot. Starting where? From the heel and go to the lateral side, like this. Starting from the heel, and it go like this. And when you do that, normally, if the person is normal, what will happen? You will see this kind of movement of the toes. Toes will flex. Flexion of the toes will occur. Okay? Flexion of the toes will occur during the scratch. And that is good. That's normal. Okay. Now, sometimes if someone has spinal cord or brain uh, you know, uh, lesion or diseases, then what can happen? You, you may see that instead of the movement of the toes this way, what will happen? The big toe will extend like this, extension of the big toe, and extension and fanning. 
This is called fanning, spreading of the other toes. So extension of the big toe and extension and fanning of other toes will occur. And that means Davinsky sign is positive. That means that person might have motor neuron disorder. Okay? That's the test uh, to see if someone has motor neuron disorder. Now, if you do this test in infants, very early stage of life, if you try that, you will see in infants what will happen? Pevsky sign will be positive. But don't take the child to the hospital. <laughs> that is normal. For infants, that is normal. Why? Because it takes few years to develop the motor control in our body. And this is very simple. That's why you know that infants, can they walk? No. Why? The motor control is not there. Right? The motor system is not developed yet completely. Why they pee? They cannot hold. Why they do that? Because they don't have any control of the sphincters. You know that the sphincters are controlled by the motor nerves, motor neurons. So that's why they cannot control. So they, their motor system is not developed yet. That's why you see they are like you no know, motor neuron disease patient. Their Dersky sign will be positive. But that's normal for the infants. Then after a couple of years, slowly, uh, you'll see the reflex. Okay, so let's stop the lecture.